Chang and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, the U.S. officially takes a step back from the global effort to save the planet. Our deep dive on President Trump's decision to withdraw from the 2015 landmark Paris Accord and how the tech industry is responding. Plus, the new smartphone to challenge Apple and Samsung seizes the spotlight, and it's designed by the same guy who created Android. We'll hear from the company about why the so-called anti-iPhone is a must-have product. And the Internet of Things to come. Chinese giant Baidu partners with German auto industry heavyweights on automated driving and connected cars. We'll discuss. But first, to our lead. President Trump has announced the United States will be withdrawing from the Paris Climate Pact and that he will seek to renegotiate the international agreement in a way that treats American workers better. I'm willing to immediately work with Democratic leaders to either negotiate our way back into Paris under the terms that are fair to the United States and its workers, or to negotiate a new deal that protects our country and its taxpayers. Jennifer Delohi, our environment and energy reporter for Bloomberg News, joins us now from our Washington bureau. Jennifer, first of all, walk us through the import of this moment. Well, it's hugely significant. The U.S. basically brought other nations to the table under President Barack Obama in trying to create this accord two years ago. Uh, so the U.S. played a leadership role in bringing it together. And there's a real question here of whether Trump's uh, decision to withdraw from the accord over the next three and a half years will encourage other countries to follow suit and leave. So far, that doesn't seem to be the case. It might actually be emboldening other countries to step up and do more. When he says he wants to renegotiate, when does that process start? It's really unclear. There's no real formal mechanism for renegotiating this deal. So if you're looking at the construct of the Paris Agreement, you know, individual countries made individual pledges that they could change at any time, generally with an idea uh, that they would go stronger, that they would get stronger over time. But there's no formal mechanism to come back to the table and force other countries to re-up their commitments, to, to strengthen their pledges. Trump did today talk about the possibility of a separate deal, so there is the possibility of separate action on greenhouse gas emissions outside of the Paris Agreement. But we've seen already indications that other countries are pushing back against this idea that there could be any kind of substantive renegotiation. All right, Bloomberg's Jennifer Delohi, thank you so much for joining us there with the latest from Washington. Uh, the tech industry has already begun to respond to Trump's announcement. Tesla's Elon Musk taking the lead, announcing his departure from the president's council in a tweet saying, I'm departing presidential councils. He warned of this yesterday. Climate change is real. Leaving Paris is not good for America or the world. Bloomberg Technology also got statements from Microsoft's chief legal officer, Brad Smith, HP's Meg Whitman, Salesforce CEO Mark Bennett, Benioff, who said, deeply disappointed by president's decision to withdraw from the Paris Agreement, we will double our efforts to fight climate change. Facebook, Google, and Apple haven't yet responded to our request for comment, but did sign a letter in May asking President Trump to stay in the Paris Climate Agreement. We know Tim Cook called the president uh, to urge him to remain. Joining us now to discuss, Colleen Regan of Bloomberg New Energy Finance and our guest host for the hour, Techonomy CEO David Kirkpatrick, who joins us from L.A. David, I'll start with you. What does it mean if technology leaders and business leaders who may not have voted for the president but were prepared to work work for him, desert him now? Well, it, I think that they've already deserted the president on most substantive issues. So it's not like they're deserting him now. I think the, the gap between President Trump and Silicon Valley is a Grand Canyon at this point. But I think what's, what's more interesting to me is the question of how committed business has become, not just Silicon Valley, but most big businesses in the United States towards climate change remediation. I mean, the issue of whether climate change is happening or not is not really controversial among most business leaders. It is accepted, as much of your reporting has already suggested. And you know, so clearly, a lot of progress is going to still be possible, even without the US in the Paris Agreement, despite the fact that I, everyone agrees it's a stupid, stupid thing to pull us out. 
Let's talk about this, Colleen. How are tech companies and broader U.S. businesses actually going to respond in action rather than words? Great question, Emily. Um, so we've already seen some action coming out of Silicon Valley from these tech companies. Uh, so if you look at just what's called the tech amici, so Amazon, Apple, Google, Microsoft, they got together um, in defense of the clean power plan earlier in 2016, and we've seen them since come out and repeat again that climate change, in their view, is one of the most significant um, issues facing our generation globally. And they are actually putting action behind these words. So they've set all four of these companies, which represent two and a half trillion of market cap, have all set 100% renewable energy goals. So they want to source all of their electricity from renewable energy uh, globally. And in fact, Google came out on record as saying that they're going to hit that target in 2017. We saw Amazon be the number one procurer of uh, clean energy in 2016 in the United States, and Apple's even signing deals for wind farms in China in order to get uh, clean energy for their suppliers. So they're very much behind this, and it's not just words, they're really taking action. China, as well. meantime, has reiterated their yes. support for the Paris Agreement. I wanted to take a look at the Bloomberg. We've got a map here of the solar plants across the country. The green shows plants that are op op already in operation. The yellow shows uh, plants that are planned. How does this map change in five years as a result of this, or does it? That's a great question. Um, in, in some ways, I think you would expect to see that green appear even more heavily in those states in which solar is already very concentrated. We're seeing, it's important to talk about what's going on on a federal level, but it's also equally important in the U.S. to be thinking about what's happening on a state level too. So just yesterday, um, the California Senate passed a bill to get 100% renew renewable energy by 2045. Uh, that still needs to make its way through the assembly, but there's absolutely activity going on at state level that will continue to drive wind and solar build. At the same time, we've seen costs fall dramatically, which means that it's becoming more economic to install solar in more areas of the country. So just um, from 2008 to 2016, we saw the cost of PV modules, which are only, only part of the panel, but the cost of PV modules fall by 90%. So this is, this is helping more states to actually invest in solar as well. Now, David, you know, President Trump is saying he's trying to protect American jobs. On the other hand, there are concerns about jobs in clean tech, jobs in new energy. Are we seeding this uh, potential big market opportunity to other countries like China? Absolutely. I mean, I think it's widely believed, particularly among people who have a sort of future-centric view, which one would hope is most business people, that you know there is a massive long-term business opportunity in remediating climate change. It's almost like I was thinking before, if you think about what World War II did or you know wars do to motivate a company or country to really garner g gather all its energies together and make rapid progress or or look at what the you know the depression did to create the WPA and all the infrastructure that we created facing a crisis can be one of the most motivating things in the economy and it's happening in China right now that they look at it that way and they are really really aggressively moving forward on uh, reme remediation technologies across the board with solar being a leading example. I want to just quickly though point to another thing that, that is really relevant to the connection between tech industry and, and this decision. You know in most states where, the, where they operate uh, in the tech companies are the number one power consumers because cloud centers are such a gigantic consumer of power. There was an article not long ago about the, even in West Virginia, the coal state, the utility there is now shutting down coal plants and putting in more renewables, partly because Microsoft and other companies are their biggest customers and they are saying, we want renewable power. This story is quickly developing. David, that's a very good point. David, you are sticking with me. David Kirkpatrick, CEO of Techonomy, Colleen Regan of Bloomberg New Energy Finance. We're going to continue to follow uh, headlines as we have them. Another developing story, Blue Apron has filed for an IPO. The meal delivery service will be listed on the New York Stock Exchange under the ticker APRN. The company reported a loss of $52.2 million the first quarter of the year on sales of $244.8 million. We'll have more on this story later this hour. Coming up, the mastermind behind Android, Andy Rubin, has unveiled his latest creation. But is there room in the market for yet another smartphone? We'll catch up with essential president and COO Niccolò Damasi next. This is Bloomberg.
Andy Rubin is back and betting on a new smartphone. Earlier this week, the creator of Android unveiled a new product from his new company, calling it the Essential Phone. But it will have some serious competition since the smartphone market has been dominated by tech giants Apple and Samsung for so many years. Rubin says his company and products have the it factor, and that appeals to the masses. Joining us now, Nicola Damasi, president and COO of Essential. So I need a little more than the it factor. What makes you think you could take on Apple and Samsung in a market where growth is slowing? Premium materials, craftsmanship, and passion, frankly, is what we're bringing back to the consumer electronics space. So You don't think Apple has that? <clears throat> I think there has been... A little bit of incrementalism in the last few years. I think there has been uh, a little bit of a boredom factor setting in. Every, you know, your grandparents have the same devices as your grandkids as you do. Um, we've got a very distinctive device, obviously. Mm -hmm. It's got the first ceramic titanium enclosure. We've got the biggest screen and the smallest form factor. And we've got a unique uh, accessory port in the back, which has this, frankly, world's smallest, most amazing 360 camera that just snaps right on the back. Um, what I think is going to happen with our device is it's going to evolve with you. Um, it's going to allow you to make your phone meaningfully more powerful over time. We're going to focus at Essential on only uh, what I think is a significant innovation uh, at all times and only significant accessories. Um, this device, for example, we're selling for $49.99. Mm -hmm. It is not only going to democratize 360 video access, but it's something that's affordable you can bring with you at all times. And you can capture, frankly, any important moment, whether it's a sporting event, a musical event, your kids' first steps. So you've worked at five mobile companies. This is your first hardware company. Let's start with the hardware. What are some custom components in the phone? Well, it's, it's, so our, it's enclosure materials. We are the only premium product that I think is using premium materials. We're not marking up our build of materials by a factor of three. Mm -hmm. We think we, we need to be a pro-consumer brand that offers our materials and our phone. And all our devices, frankly, at a, at a, at a great value proposition. Um, our full display is the first rounded screen. We've got our camera knocks through the middle of it. Um, and ultimately, uh, you can think about what we're doing in the long term of this device by looking at the back. Um, we are using a fingerprint sensor that's on the back. We have an internal camera that's got a black and white fusion color mm. uh, system. And our next device will actually swallow all the edges up. So we're almost uh, basically bezel-less at the moment. That's because of the titanium. We've got thinner edges on the device than anybody else. And frankly, it's, it's distinctive. So I have to say we're bringing back the cool factor. What sort of software customizations are there on top of the Android base? We're actually going for purest, cleanest, simplest Android. So Andy's operating system's been around a while. It's obviously, I think, 85% of the market. Um, we think that we know how to take advantage of it better than almost any other firm, if not any other firm in the market. And we're trying to, frankly, unleash the full power of the pure Android operating system. Will third-party accessory makers be able to make things for the connector on the back? They, they will, in the fullness of time. I mean, it'll be a curated experience to start with, but there will be, we're big on open ecosystems. There will be a developer network around that. Um, our Android ecosystem play will have basically no preloaded apps, minimal preloads that we're going for. We think people want choice. Um, but yeah, I, th I think you're right. We're going to be able to turn the back into a real standard in the long term, a hardware developer network. So the home operating system, mm -hmm. Ambient OS, that you, you are also putting out, this is, you know, the idea is to be a connected uh, operating system for the home. The connected home has yet to take off. When will it? I mean, what do we need to get there? That's a good question. I mean, I think Andy and I believe that the home's in about the same stage of development as the phone was in 2004 when he started Android. So we're intent in the next five to 10 years on building out that horizontal play. Mm -hmm. um, I think in, the, in developed nations, it's going to take the better part of a decade for us to go from single, really just digital appliances is what people have in the home. We're trying to build the first device to actually help you chore choreograph your home automate, connect it all together, and we're doing that without being another walled garden. So you think Android is just fine. Will you ever build your own phone OS? We'd we'll never say never in the long run, mm -hmm. but in the short run, we think there's a lot that we can do to add premium hardware to a great operating system. Uh, and we feel that no one's ever done full justice to the Android operating mm -hmm. system with the hardware. So we're a hardware business when it comes to the phone and things like our 360 camera. We're a software hardware full stack on the home. So Apple is launching, as far as we believe, a, a Siri speaker, home speaker to take on Google Home, Amazon Echo. What does Apple bring to the market 
or is it too late? I think we're in the first inning in the home, to be honest. Um, mm -hmm. We're kind of like where the phone market was in 2004 and 5 mm -hmm. when we're just scratching the surface of capabilities. Mm -hmm. There will be a lot of change. One of the things that, you know, that Andy and I are passionate on is believing that in the long run, consumers want stuff to just work and they want to be able to buy whatever point solutions they want. Mm -hmm. So we don't think the winning model is going to be, you have to use all my stuff for it to play well together. Mm -hmm. We want to provide that horizontal layer that enables you to pick whatever you want out for your speakers, your stereo system, your TV, your lights, your front door lock, your baby monitor. Um, think about the long tail in the home, and it's actually a much longer tail than a mobile device market was. There's a lot of sentimental value in there and so on still to come. All right. Well, thanks for stopping by and breaking it all down for us. Niccolo Damasi, Essential President and COO. Great to have you back here on the show. My pleasure. In a different role. Coming up, Box is standing out in the crowded cloud space and generating cash in its coffers. We'll hear from CEO Aaron Levy about the company's latest earnings report and what goals they plan to tackle next. This is Bloomberg. It was a banner quarter for cloud content manage comp management company Box. Positive earnings results helped push the stock to a 52-week high. Two analysts raised the price target on the company. Investors were particularly pleased the company maintained its goal of being cash flow positive, a big challenge for a tech firm looking to grow. We spoke with Box CEO Aaron Levy about the results and the company's partnerships with Amazon, Google, and Facebook, and how important they are to the company. We have to make sure that we're plugged into the different applications that our customers are using. So uh, if you're using Facebook for the enterprise, uh, which is their new workplace product, uh, we want to make sure that content can be served up securely within that environment. If you're using IBM's workflow technology, we want to ensure that we can plug in uh, to that uh, software very seamlessly as well. If you're using Slack uh, for communication on Teams, we want to make sure Box can be the back-end system for that content. So really any application that, uh, that gets created or used in the enterprise, we want to ensure that we have a deep and integration to power the content management and uh, underlying data management within that app for our customers. So uh, partnering is fundamental to our strategy. We're uh, very excited that uh, over the past year, uh, you've seen some pretty expansive partnerships with companies like Microsoft, Google, IBM, and many others. Um, and, uh, and these are very core to our strategy. How does now being free cash flow positive impact the business? Yeah, I think um, you know this is obviously one of the biggest uh, concerns or questions that Wall Street had uh, when we were first going public. You know, we were growing very quickly, but at the same time, we were burning a lot of cash. And I think the big question was, what was this business going to look like at scale, um, and was there going to be a convergence point? And we told the market that Q4 of uh, FY17, so that was our uh, that was January that uh, that we just kind of came through. We said we would be cash flow positive uh, in that quarter, and we did achieve that. So um, so that was uh, what we had guided Wall Street to, and. Now, uh, for the full year for fiscal uh, 2018, which is the year we're in right now, we also guided that we will be cash flow positive on a full year basis. And really what this means is, uh, obviously, we don't have to raise outside capital anymore because we're, we're now generating cash. We have over $200 million in the bank. Um, so that's really positive. But uh, I think more importantly, it shows that as we are growing still pretty rapidly with 30% uh, growth on the top line, we are generating uh, a very, very healthy core business model, and we have very strong and healthy economics um, at the foundation of the business, which obviously is incredibly important to just running our, our company, but also equally important to Wall Street's understanding of really what we're building. You've been critical of President Trump, Aaron, and when he was a candidate last summer, you signed a letter along with 100 other tech leaders saying he would be a disaster for innovation. Box shares are up 30 percent. Has Trump been the disaster for innovation that you expected him to be? <laughs> Well, I, I would probably separate our, our business performance from some of the policies uh, that uh, that have been enacted. I would say as it relates to uh, tech innovation and the innovation economy, uh, we really haven't gotten much of a clear message from this new administration about what uh, they believe uh, are going to be the defining factors over the next decade and coming decades to really, truly driving a high innovation economy. Uh, that uh, would range from things like uh, high-skilled immigration, uh, STEM education, uh, 
digital policy issues like encryption reform, uh, patent uh, reform. So you have a lot of issues where they are still, uh, it's still really unknown what the administration's viewpoint is on, uh, on these uh, uh, major issues that are going to be not just fundamental to the tech sector and Silicon Valley, but really the broader economy as more and more of our economy moves into the, the digital age. So um, I think it's still very, very early. Um, and uh, unfortunately, we haven't seen some of the policies that we'd like to see uh, that would drive innovation forward in a much longer term picture as opposed to just the past you know, 100 or uh, 140 days or so. What about climate change? What are the biggest threats to the tech industry with regard to Trump's stance on the Paris Accord? Yeah, I think we have a, a real risk in things like climate change and things like immigration reform and the travel ban as it really, uh, when you look at things like internet policy where we have historically been a leader around the world in setting the tone and sending and sending a message to the rest of the world uh, about really what we're going to stand for and what our philosophies are going to be as a, as a country. Aaron Levy there, CEO of Box. Coming up, Blue Apron is the latest tech startup to file for an IPO, but is the timing right in an increasingly crowded food tech space? We'll discuss next. And a reminder of our new interactive TV function. You can find it at TV Go on the Bloomberg. You can watch us live. If you miss an interview, you can go back to it. You can send our producers a message. You can play along with the charts that we bring you on air. This is for Bloomberg subscribers only. Check it out at TV Go. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang. Let's return to our lead. President Trump has decided to pull the U.S. out of the Paris Climate Accord. The move has huge implications across the globe and throughout several industries, and CEOs are already speaking out. Google CEO Sundar Pichai just responded, saying, disappointed with today's decision, Google will keep working hard for a cleaner, more prosperous future for all. GE CEO Jeff Immelt tweeted, disappointed with today's decision on the Paris Agreement. Climate change is real. Industry must now lead and not depend on government. Earlier on Bloomberg Television, we heard from Virgin Group founder Richard Branson. Here's his reaction. Well, I mean, I've been to Antarctic. I've been to the Arctic. I, I live on an island. Um, the effects are just beginning. Um, and, uh, and, the, and, and, you know, you can could, you could just see it in, you know, slightly higher tides, um, uh, you know, slightly less, well, quite a lot less ice in the Arctic. Um, you know, glaciers moving backwards. Um, you know, it's just the start, and 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 that's what's so sad. And um, you know, I mean, Trump says that we're only going to reduce it by a tiny bit if we all do this together. That's not that's not the case. If we move quickly and determinedly, we we can uh, protect our grandchildren from the effects of climate change, and uh, you know, we can we can have a wonderful environment that we live in in our cities. It's clean, a clean environment where people are not going to, uh, you know, get ill from uh, pollution. We can have fuel that is, you know, that we're not in danger of suddenly spiking at $150 a barrel again. It will forever be under $30 a barrel. I mean, uh, you know, I've just come from Aruba where we just set up, the, you know, on a not-for-profit basis, the biggest uh, solar park. It's now less than 10 cents per kilowatt. It's cheaper, you know, four times as cheaper as uh, as um, oil uh, was only you know, two or three years ago. And the price is coming down and down and down. Uh, so, it, it, you know, it, it, it's just um, incomprehensible that uh, that America has a president that is 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 uh, is blind. Basically, it's just too too sad for words. It's interesting, though, that we have these sort of uh, the nationalist movements, not just in the U.S., but uh, in the U.K. as well. I mean, you, the, the entire Brexit campaign also seems to be focused very much on sort of uh, uh, looking uh, inwardly. And I wonder your notions of, of Brexit right here. How does Brexit affect uh, both climate and, and your business interests there? Um, look, I think that I, I personally believe that um, what happened with Brexit, what happened with Trump, the, the, the reaction against both will be will be so strong, uh, and we're beginning to see it in in France. I think we'll see it in Germany um, that the world will come back to a much more sensible way of you know normal way of thinking again, um, and, uh, and 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 a thinking where 
nations will work together again in 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 everybody's interest. I mean, this whole thing about you know. Uh, you know, let's just fight for our country and nobody else's country. Let's just fight for our people, nobody else's people. It's a, it's horrible. I mean, it's just um, you know, we we ought to be uh, a united world that that uh, works together um, uh, and and fights for all our interests. That was Virgin Group founder Richard Branson speaking with our editor at large, Corey Johnson. A story we reported earlier, Blue Apron has filed for an IPO. The meal delivery service will be listed on the New York Stock Exchange under the ticker APRN. Each month, Blue Apron delivers about 8 million meal kits, complete with recipes along with raw ingredients. The company has been signing up subscribers at an impressive clip and last year generated between $750 million and a $1 billion in revenue, according to a person familiar with the finances. Our Bloomberg IPO reporter Alex Barinka joins us now from New York and Techonomy CEO David Kirkpatrick is also with us from LA. Alex, let's start with you. What exactly do we know? So we have the S1 now, uh, which we know now that they are moving forward. You'll remember, uh, according to our sources, we reported late last year, they delayed this IPO process as they tried to kind of uh, preen up their finances. They weren't quite where they wanted to be. Right now, we know the company posted a net loss of about $55 million last year on revenue of about uh, 700 95 million. Uh, revenue did double uh, in 2016 from 2015. So you can see now that they have uh, some growth to preach to investors as they go down this IPO process. But you know what I think is interesting digging into this uh, deal prospectus, you do start to see how they position itself. And for a company that's in the food delivery industry, that's going to be increasingly important. It's a very competitive industry. We've already seen casualties by the wayside. Uh, Sprig just last week shut down. So Blue Apron is coming in here and basically saying they have a powerful brand connection. Uh, they have superior product at compelling values. They're constantly innovating on their product. So how, what that actually means for a company that, that uh, sends delivery, delivers kits of food for their customers, I think we need a bit more clarity on, but we're at least getting to see behind the scenes and uh, on some of the financials of one of these food delivery companies. David, what's your take on the food delivery industry? It's clear there are going to be losers. Will there be a few winners? Will there be many? <laughs> well, I would echo some of what Alex was saying. First of all, their growth is spectacular. Their growth is 10x over two years. I mean, they had like 75 million in 2014, and in 2016, they had something close to 800 million. That's amazing. And I also was reading the prospectus, and I have to say, I'm impressed. They're talking about themselves as a lifestyle brand. I think if you look at this not as the food delivery business, but as the creation of new lifestyle brands around crucial human activities, that might be the way to think of this company, and it might suggest if they can actually fulfill that vision, they would have a very potentially promising future. But you know, they're gonna go up against Amazon. Let's just name that one. That's the company that I would worry about most for them. So if anything to do with any kind of delivery, including food, Amazon is the company to worry about, and that's gonna be what any company in this industry is gonna be focusing on, including them. I'm getting hungry just watching this video now. Alex, talk to us about <laughs> momentum in the tech IPO market in general. Obviously, Snap went out earlier this year. Uh, this is another sign that the door is open. What's next? The door is opening, and that's exactly right. This year, we've already had about $6 billion worth of tech IPOs. Compare that to last year's just over $3 billion. It's already doubled, and we're only in June. So the momentum is definitely there. The markets seem to be behaving. Uh, calm is always good for the listings market. So. We have a Blue Apron. I also saw Tintree, another enterprise tech company, dropped its S1 uh, aftermarket today as well. So companies like this are moving. I will say, for Blue Apron specifically, people are also going to be looking at its close competitor, Sunbasket, which has hired banks for an IPO as well. They just took money from Unilever. So when it comes to uh, Blue Apron and the, the toughest competitor, whether it's uh, beating them to the market or not, is going to be Sunbasket and, as David said, Amazon, obviously. So. All signs are to the green for IPOs in general. This will be our first consumer tech listing since Snap went public earlier this year. All right, our Bloomberg News IPO reporter, Alex Barinka, thanks so much for joining us. Techonomy CEO, David Kirkpatrick, you're sticking with me. 
Shares of BlackBerry jumped in Thursday trading, reaching their highest price in more than two years. This after Citron Research said the company was likely a target for a buyout and at a high premium. The report added BlackBerry's security software for the automotive industry called QNX could be a game changer in self-driving car technology. Coming up, Baidu has brought two auto heavyweights to its side in the race to develop autonomous driving technology. We'll dive into the implications of the alliance next. After a long search, Airbnb has finally found an executive to run its China operations. The vacation rental company has appointed Hong Ge as vice president in charge of its business in the Asian nation. Hong's job will be to help Airbnb crack what could be its toughest market yet. The company has spent years raising money and preparing the groundwork for expansion into China, a country where local players and laws have humbled tech giants ranging from Google to Uber. Hong previously worked at Google and Facebook, but has been building Airbnb China for the last year. The company has about 30 employees and 75,000 listings in China and said last year that it plans to increase staff in the country to 300 in two years. Hong will report to Airbnb CEO Brian Chesky directly. Speaking of the China market now, one of the country's largest internet providers just made a major move to help bring their autonomous driving aspirations to fruition. Baidu has partnered with two German auto industry heavyweights, Bosch and Continental, to work on not only automated driving, but connected cars and mobility services. The alliance pits Baidu against other leading internet companies, including Alphabet and established car makers like Ford and GM. Joining me now here in the studio, Baidu Silicon Valley AI Lab Director Adam Coates and still with us from LA, my guest host, Techonomy CEO David Kirkpatrick. So, Adam, first of all, as the tech develops, as uh, these other giants move forward with their plans, what does I Baidu have on anyone else? I think, uh, you know, Baidu is definitely uh, the AI leader in China, has an incredible technology brand and technology talent. Uh, and so when it comes to things like self-driving cars, uh, this is going to be powered by uh, things like the Project Apollo, uh, Baidu's recently open sourced uh, software for self-driving cars. And that's actually uh, one of the points where we're excited to collaborate with uh, top suppliers like Bosch and Continental to further develop the technology. So do you see Baidu as a leader in self-driving cars in China or as a leader in self-driving cars globally? I think uh, definitely globally. Uh, we have the, the technical capabilities to do this, um, and especially uh, like with these sorts of partnerships, uh, I think also the ability to work well with others um, to get these technologies into actual products. And how do you see AI being integrated across Baidu products, self-driving cars aside? Uh, I think uh, AI is actually going to affect lots and lots of different industries. Uh, so one thing I'm very excited about is smart devices, for example. Um, that of course look very different on the surface, but a lot of the AI techniques that we develop and that uh, the engineers and researchers at Baidu are experts in uh, are, are still amenable to that. So things like speech recognition and text-to-speech that make it possible for you to talk to any device in your home or in your car, uh, these are all a part of this AI ecosystem. Uh, and Baidu is going to be a major player in all of that. David, every day there are new developments in self-driving cars. There are also new setbacks as well. Which company do you think is best positioned to lead here? Well, I would say, you know, it's, it's a tough thing to say you're going to be the leader in self-driving car technology because there are a lot of competitors trying to do that. I mean, ultimately, you know, with all due respect, I think Google is the company I would bet on the most through its Waymo subsidiary, the Alphabet subsidiary, I mean. Um, but it is interesting to think about Baidu's opportunity as the world's second largest search engine after Google, because in developing AI, one of the key factors is the quantity of data you have to test your software against. And search engines have a fundamental advantage, which is one reason why many observers believe Google is really ahead on AI of the other American companies. But Baidu has a lot of intrinsic advantages for developing AI, which can then be applied in self-driving cars along with other areas. So I would consider them a, a legitimate and serious contender, but boy, every automaker and a lot of, even out of left field companies, are really, really targeting this market because it's going to be huge. But then again, China's maybe where it's going to take off first for all kinds of reasons. So that's another advantage Baidu has. How would you respond to that, Adam? Yeah, I think the observation about uh, data, for example, is fantastic and correct. 
Um, I think it's also underestimated how hard it is to build a, a bleeding edge AI team. Mm -hmm. uh, I know Baidu's already recognized uh, definitely as the AI leader in China. They have all the technology and the talent to do this. And part of what's important to me in the Silicon Valley AI Lab is how do we share that with the rest of the world and, and enable them to make this revolution happen. The talent wars are fierce in self-driving car technology. We've seen this big showdown between Google and Uber when it comes to Anthony Lewandowski, who was just fired. How would you describe the competition for talent is behind the scenes? Definitely really hot. It's such a fantastic time to be in the field because so much is happening. Um, but I also think that because AI is affecting so many different industries, it's going to be more than any one person. Uh, it's going to take thousands of people uh, to really make this happen. And I'm pretty grateful that, that Baidu has attracted a lot of that talent already. And how do you see Baidu has this deep speech product? How do you see some of these other products being integrated into the self-driving platform? Yeah, I think uh, once you're into sort of automated driving, um, I think things like uh, voice recognition and having a natural experience is fantastic. Um, I think increasingly all of these smart devices are moving not just from being in our homes, but also in automobiles and the other places that we spend a lot of our time. Uh, and that convenience and naturalness is going to be really critical to the future of how we inter interact with technology. All right, Adam Coates, director of Baidu's Silicon Valley AI Lab. Thanks so much for stopping by. Yes. David Kirkpatrick. Techonomy CEO, my guest host for the hour, David, as always, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Coming up, the video game industry's rapid growth now worth over $100 billion, with China accounting for almost a quarter of global market share. We'll dig into the new gaming report next. And a quick programming note, we will have full coverage this Friday of the U.S. Jobs Report on Bloomberg Television and Radio. Janice Capital Fund Manager Bill Gross will be giving instant reaction with the Bloomberg Daybreak Americas team. You can catch that conversation 8.30 a.m. Eastern. In another move to compete with Amazon, Walmart is testing a delivery service using its own workers. Employees can earn extra pay to deliver goods at the end of their work shift. The workers have to use their own cars to deliver packages assigned near their homes. The test is being run at three locations in Arkansas, New Jersey, and aims to better compete with the delivery services of Amazon. Well, China just topped the U.S. as the gaming capital of the world in terms of market size. This according to a report published by London-based venture capital firm Atomico. Revenue from computer games exceeded $100 billion globally in a single year for the very first time. And of that number, 600 million gamers in China generated $24.6 billion of the industry's total. Just ahead of the U.S. is $24.1 billion. Earlier, Bloomberg's Nate Langson spoke to Atomico co-founder Matthias Lungman and head of research Tom Tom Wiemeyer about their gaming report. He started by asking if we're close to having a single video game with one billion users. Well, I think that's something really exciting to think about, but I think we're pretty far from uh, getting there right now. Uh, but what we can say is that the games today are becoming much more enduring that we, than we thought they would be. I mean, I think previously we thought these mobile games, oh, they'll be a flash in a pan and they'll disappear. But we're seeing now that they're actually becoming quite old companies and lasting brands. And so Angry Birds, The Clash of Clans, uh, and so on are, are beginning to, to, to keep the test of time. And what about sort of individual user spending, Matthias, in terms of uh, the Chinese market? Are they, are they spending significantly more per user than, than anywhere else in the world or, or lower? Well, this is the th thing, again, I think most people would think that China is a place where you have lots of users and actually not a lot of spend. But it's actually a little bit of the reverse at the moment. The trend has been incredible. Over the last three years, the amount that Chinese are spending online has increased by 10x. And so they've jumped up the table. And so today, a Chinese gamer is, is spending 30% more than a, than a US gamer. So the transition has been pretty incredible. Mm. Um, Tom, one of the big surprises for me, I think, was sort of how loyal Chinese gamers are uh, to the Chinese uh, headquartered companies making the games. I think something like 93% uh, of, of, of gamers in China are, are playing games uh, or spending on games developed by Chinese companies. I mean, is that figure accurate? I mean, how, how does that compare to what you expected, maybe? No, that's right. You know, the Chinese market in terms of games is the most localized in the world, even more so than, than other very local markets such as Japan or Korea. Um, 
But I, you know, I think if you look at other content um, categories, whether it's the film industry or the music industry, you know, what we've seen is that there is strong demand in China for great international content. Um, you know, film franchises such as The Furious or Transformers, or even actually Rovio's Angry Birds movie, have had enormous success in China. And I think you know what we've also seen looking specifically at games is that you know European games companies such as Supercell and Rovio and and uh, and, and Mojang with Minecraft too. These have all, um, you know, had had a lot of success in China, and, and actually some of the numbers that we found were that European games companies have been able to increase their revenue in China ninefold in just the space of two years. So we're now seeing that those companies uh, are already generating hundreds of millions of dollars in that market. But of course, given the sheer scale of the Chinese market, you know, they're, they're barely scratching the surface. And so, you know, what what we take away from that is that. There's an enormous opportunity here, and, and the way that we think that games companies will be able to capture that is through deeper collaboration. And I think what we stand on the verge of is, is a period whereby you'll see you know, much closer collaboration and partnership between Chinese games companies on the one hand and those from other regions, whether from Europe or, or elsewhere. And, and certainly Tencent with Supercell or NetEase with Blizzard are, are two very good examples of that. That was Bloomberg's Nate Langson with Atomico partner Matthias Lungman and head of research Tom Wiemeyer. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. All episodes live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV weekdays, 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. That is all for now. This is Bloomberg.